good morning and welcome to another edition of Bumper to Bumper Radio. He's Dave Riccio, I'm Matt Allen, and we are your KTAR car guys here every single Saturday from 11 to noon. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are helping you, the motoring public, the car owner, uh, have a better overall repair experience, uh, driving experience, ownership experience, whatever experience with your car, we want to help make it better. And to do that, just tune into the show every Saturday and we can help you. If you want to participate, it's easy, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. So any questions, any way you want to participate, don't be shy. And if you are shy, maybe you can text in. We're doing that now, 411-923. If you want to get involved with the show, you can certainly do that by text as well. And uh, today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap... We've got Factor Fiction. Dave, always. Dave will come up with something. As always, open phones and open texting. And the the seasons are changing. You know, if we, if we had four seasons in Phoenix, we might see some, some red and yellow leaves and some things happening uh, out here. I guess you've got to go north for that. Uh, but it was a little chilly this morning. I, I, uh, 59 degrees, I think it was, or, or some of the lows this week and next week. And it's time of year we see some different things happening with the oh, car. First thing this morning when I got in to come out to the station, a little yellow light that looked like a horseshoe. Uh, and I'm like, oh, man, not that thing again. And that's at the lucky <laughs> the la- horseshoe. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I saw that horseshoe-looking thing was last October. You know, that's what made me think, man, every year i got to deal with this whole tire pressure monitoring system. And I find that people hate the TPMS, you know? Are you familiar with TPMS? If you just bought a new car this last year, this is a new deal for you that you haven't been down. You know that road. You know what was it? Two thousand and seven was mandatory. Yeah, two thousand seven tire pressure monitoring systems are mandatory, and uh, some go by actual pressure. Some use the wheel speed sensor to look at the difference in, in uh, rolling speed between the tires to let you know if one is low. But just this dip in temperature can, that we have overnight now can certainly be enough to cause that light, as you had. And the reason that light comes on is you know the air is expanding and contracting with temperature, so therefore it's cooler out. Temperature in the tire, you know, pressure in the tire drops because of the temperature. Now that light's on. Now it's time to go top off your tires, uh, you know, and then you don't want to mix the winter air with the summer air. That's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dave, don't don't confuse anybody because we, we do nitrogen in tires and people will come in with this flat tire and say, oh, my God, I'm glad I made it. I, I, didn't, I couldn't go anywhere else because you guys put in the nitrogen. No. We're breathing, what, I think, 78% of it right now anyway. So so you don't. if you do have nitrogen, anybody can top off that tire. Uh, not a big deal with the, the summer can... air and the winter. You have know, blinker fluid now too, right? Uh, high-speed blinker fluid and then the halogen type as well. You know, that's a big deal. You don't want to go with the non-halogen type blinker fluid. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what else? So you've got the tire pressure monitoring lights that come on. And, and you might find that if you drive for a little bit, Go get six or seven miles on the road. Heats that, up. It's going to heat up and, and and turn off. But you still need to go get a tire pressure check somewhere. And just Well, the other one that comes to mind, I mean, symptoms are lights that turn on, radiator light, because now it's cooler out. Maybe your car was having trouble getting up to operating temperature. Well, in Arizona in the summertime, your car is not having problems getting up to operating temperature. But now that it's only, you know, 70 degrees out or 60 degrees out when you're first, you know, headed for work, your car may stay cooler longer than it should if, you know, you got a thermostat issue. Uh, so you may see a check engine light. And a lot of times that'll throw a check engine light. Well, and these manufacturers for the EPA regulations for fuel mileage, they want to get the cars up to operating temperature running as hot as possible, as quick as possible. Well, in the old days, I mean, we used to run cars a lot cooler, but, you know, we decided at 210 degrees, that's when the car is the most efficient as far as complete combustion of the fuel. Is that right, Dave? Uh, Did you just make that up? It sounded pretty good. (laughs) Because the cars are running hotter now. Yeah, they are. So so what might be common is you, you might get a check engine light, the car is running good, cars like to be fat running rich we call that mm. when they're dumping fuel cars run well then run like so a the, scolded dog <laughs> so <laughs> so the so the car's not going to complain about it too much you may not have any symptom you're de- it's not like an old carbureted car where the choke went bad and this thing's plugging black smoke like a 
like a diesel down the down the road or or is not running it's going to it's going to run well but what you might notice is you're not going to have any temperature maybe that are no heat maybe the defrost isn't working as well you're shivering a little bit you should have that that temperature gauge if you have a gauge in your car you typically want to see that that needle at about the halfway point that's how most gauges are designed to run right in the middle well i know that october is national car care month you know according to hallmark it's actually not according to Hallmark, but it's according to somebody. And uh, I scribbled down some other things that you want to be checking into, being that it's October and winter's just around the corner. Good time to get your car in the shop. If you're not, if you want some things you can do yourself. Wiper blades, for sure. You know, throw a good set of wiper blades on there. You know, you have some winter storms and snow and sleet and whatever happens. You know what I found, too, on the wiper blades, Dave? We've just been cleaning them off lately. You know, and I think that was sparred by a complaint. We put some wipers on somebody's car and... July and they say, well, I just put them on. They, you know, we never use them. They get impaled with bugs and plastered. And you go wipe them and they smear. So maybe before you go spend twenty five bucks on a set of wipers, just some. Bro- I uh, actually cloth. saw in the auto parts store the other day they make a wiper blade dressing. <laughs> I think it comes with the blades. To put <laughs> no, on. I mean it is a wiper blade dressing if you want to treat your uh, wiper blades. So wiper blades come up. Uh, batteries. You know, we think of it's hot and that's when batteries die in this town. But they call it cold cranking amps for a reason. That's when they rate batteries when it's cold. They don't produce as well. So batteries, and you're running your headlights a lot more. Well, yeah. You know, I notice now I'm going home, go to leave the shop, and it's 630. It's dark. I'm not used to that. I think it's 8 o'clock or don't something. Don't pretend you but, work all day. No, I don't. <laughs> all night. No. But uh, so, yeah, you're using the headlights more. So it's not that the, the cold necessarily is killing the battery, at least in our climate. But uh, it's all the extra loads, the headlights being on longer, whatever the case may be. The other one, Dave, I think of, we get a lot now, and I'm sure you do this time of year, is transmission. Mm. It's cold out. That fluid, the oil contracts. You go, what, you drop it in reverse, and the car doesn't want to move Nothing anywhere. happens. The morning sickness of transmission. So it may have been low on fluid all summer long. You had no idea. But now that it's cold out, it's going to feel really low. Well, and I guess the same thing might go with power steering systems. Just everything uh, that's on the margin, I guess the, the – The swing is going to make a difference. Yeah, the, t- the high temperatures of the summer are really going to test the integrity of the system. How strong is that plastic radiator tank or how w- well is that water pump seal or that hose? But when you get into cold, I think it's more the fluid levels. I mean, it's I, always the startup too. When you start it up, you get the old tick, 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 tick noise. Sometimes that's an exhaust leak. Sometimes that's a little bit of a valve noise. Tick, 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 tick. You know, that shows or, up in the winter. Or maybe time. sometimes the guy that doesn't uh, put the right oil in your car because you've got that five dollar uh, super duper oil change special at the whatever mm. shop, and they, you know, everybody that that price is for the. The, the cheap stuff. The 1030, but your car needs 520 or 530. <laughs> so now is maybe a good time to make sure you've got the right oil in your car. Don't go with what Grandpa always says, use the 1040. Yeah, don't put the thin stuff in the winter, the thick stuff or whatever. I mean, everyone's got their theory on oil. Whatever the manufacturer says put in there, that's what you're putting in your car. You know, that's my big thing. Factory fill. Factory fill, huh? So yeah. hydrogen. Why do people put hydrogen in their tires? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe they're making, using it. they're making bombs. Or did you mean nitrogen? Did I say hydrogen? You did. Yes. We are making bombs. <laughs> <laughs> Just let that thing get down to the steel cords. We'll make ourselves a spark and kaboom. <laughs> hydrogen tires. I was looking up uh, hydrogen-propelled cars earlier. I think that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> One of many, Dave. <laughs> One of many. So what's your question on the so nitrogen? So nitrogen. I mean, I, I think not everyone understands nitrogen. If you're the automotive enthusiast, you're the guy that wants just, hey, man, I just want the cream of the crop. I want the best stuff. There is a benefit to putting nitrogen in your tires. How much does that work to you? That's up to you. you know. But the reason we do nitrogen, there's less of a swing uh, with the temperatures when it's nitrogen in the tire. Also, it's a bigger molecule, so it doesn't slip out of the tire as much. Some other benefits, Matt? Well, just a more consistent tire pressure. It, don't buy nitrogen because you think you're going to get better gas mileage. Mm. You will over the life of the tire. Just in in the, in, in California, uh, you know they've the, they've made rules where you have to um, if if the car goes into the shop, you have to as a shop owner, you must check and document tire pressures. Okay. Well, they do that for a reason. They're doing it under the guideline guise of 
it's better fuel economy and better for the environment. If people have better inflated tires, they're going to uh, not pollute as much. Mm. So that would be one reason on the nitrogen. But the notion that's going to save you gas tomorrow, you're crazy. I've been filling my tires with helium now for years. <laughs> it <laughs> it improves my gas mileage because the car kind of floats but down the road. But then depending on also on the nitrogen, if you're not purging the tires, you've got to fill with nitrogen, let the air out, fill it, let the air out, fill it, let the air out. You're not going to get as pure of a of a content in the tires. So on your first fill up, it may be a low concentration, but over some time, you're back in that shop in three or five months, and they they're topping off your tires again and again. You're going to slowly work out the other uh, junk that's in the air uh, besides the nitrogen and get that to a higher percentage. Well, when we come back, we've got wide open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. If you've got any questions related to your car and your car experience, could be the backseat of your car experience, give us a call. <laughs> You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio trying to have some fun with Matt Allen, and we're trying to help you with your car. All you got to do to get involved with this show is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR, never said that before, or you can send your text to 411923. Hey, did you hear Toyota? They got cleared on one of them court cases for a runaway vehicle. I think that was a pretty big victory for them. I, I don't know which one it was. I'm thinking it was the one in San Diego where the... The highway patrolman and his wife were in the car, but the mm. how, what the jury they find they're not not guilty. They're not responsible. Not think, responsible. The, I'm not uh, sure where you got your facts, but it was a 66 year old lady. She was diabetic, and they kind of blamed it on health issues or something other than the runaway car. Fourth, you give me a strange look, but I did read up. <laughs> <laughs> just, but but uh, that's been such a big deal, uh, or was for it was in the news for a while, and. If you don't understand, cars used to always have throttle cables. So there was a little, literally a cable that was connected to the pedal that ran, you know, under the hood up to the throttle body or the carburetor. And when you push the gas, it pulled on the throttle. And uh, that's the way they were. So if your throttle stuck, you just put your foot behind the gas pedal and you could pull it back the other way. Just like that, right, Dave? To get it unstuck. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. I do that all the time. So, but in the late model cars, there's what we call drive-by wires. So there's a sensor on the pedal. And there's an electric motor on the throttle underneath the hood. And the computer tells the motor how to operate. And the, the issue was that, hey, we thought that these computers were going haywire and telling the car just to accelerate out of control. Not and happening. So now, now cars do have a brake override. So if you hit the brake, you can't have wide open throttle at the same time. But that's a new technology that came about because of the issue. You know who I think is really going to benefit from that uh, brake cutout uh, deal, whatever you, whatever the formal name for it was there day? I think the rental car industry, because I will not be able to annihilate them. <laughs> you do brake stands and rental cars? <laughs> the, the rental cars that, that I get a hold of now. I used to have a bumper sticker that said, this, this road is made for four-wheel drives and rental cars. <laughs> anyway. Well, but, you know... When the, when that throttle activity was happening though, that's when I bought my Toyota. the The prices were down. I don't believe there was anything wrong. They came up with these fixes. I guess uh, it's not been in the news lately, so I don't remember all the you know all the details about it. But it uh, it was a lot of hype. If your car ever does get st the throttle does stick, just put the car and take it and put it in neutral. You can do that with a Prius. Yeah, you know, and you can turn it off. You can just Push the button, hold it down for three seconds, boop. Stand on the brakes away. and let go of the, and turn the thing. In the neutral. Prius was really the deal where they were having issues, and we're going to have Glenn from uh, Goodworks Auto Repair in Tempe, who's a hybrid guy. That's what they do. They're the hybrid shop. They do a lot of hybrid work. So that'll be an interesting show. We'll probably do something out of his shop. So we are going to go with Robert in Phoenix on a 1992 Geo Prism. Go ahead, Robert. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. No, it's a, G, it's a Geo uh, Metro. I bought it new, 92. It's got the 1,000cc um, uh, uh, three-cylinder. Race car. Yeah, and I, I love it as a sports car because I've owned, uh, you know, things like a Jaguar, Austin Healey, and those things. Nice. Anyway, um, it, it's got 150,000 miles on it, and the seat's worn down to the point where I sit really low, to the almost to the springs. And I like it that way because it doesn't have a roll bar, um, and so I think it's safer. But here's the problem. The, um, 
the uh, airbag uh, is in the middle of the steering wheel and it faces me, my face. Uh, is, that, is that fatal if that goes off? And should I disable it or what? Are, are you talking in relation to the the height of your seat with the cushion, or just yeah, there's in the, general? Yeah, there's, there's all the padding's gone. It's a '92. It's got 150,000 miles on it. All the padding's gone. I like it because it gives me. It's more like a, a, a cabin forward type thing where I sit really low. Sure. Well, I think if you're in a normal seated position, and, and your seat belt is on like it's supposed to be, and the and the airbag goes off. You're as fine as you can be in a Geo Metro, right? <clears throat> you I mean, want that. You want that thing going off. <laughs> I would. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, what? I noticed with my seat, my old truck, my seat wore out. I started having back problems because I was sitting kind of at an angle. You got your big Costanza wallet in there, <laughs> right? All, Costanza yeah. wallet. You know, the next thing I'm, I'm all, sitting sideways, walking sideways, doing everything sideways. So I would, you know. Go see an upholstery shop. These guys are experts at rebuilding. Well, but seats. he's not worried about the seat. He likes the. He way should be worried about the seat. I'm <laughs> telling you, Robert, you got to be worried about the seat. It's going to hurt your back, uh, and and your you know the airbag is a concern. But the car was designed. I mean, if all the padding is gone, I mean it's uh, maybe it's a creature comfort. But go see an upholstery guy. Let him rebuild that thing. Yeah, but you'll be fine <laughs> if you're if you're strapped in. The airbag will do what it's supposed to do. So thanks for the call, Robert. How about Frank in Phoenix with a 1994 Chevy? 1500 pickup. What can we do for you, Frank? Morning, guys. This is a 94 Chevy with a 4.3 V6, and it has 307,000. And I had the transmission rebuilt at 140. But now when I go 65 down the freeway, the tax says about three grand, and it used to say just under two grand. But it seems to shift up through the gears fine. But it seems like the, trans- is it the transmission is slipping or what? You said three grand, and it used to be two grand, and it's sixty-five miles per hour. Yes, sir. Yeah, it does seem a little high. Like maybe we're not getting all the way up in there into fourth gear. Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't know the transmission is necessarily slipping, but you should feel when you leave a stoplight. If you were to accelerate all the way up to sixty-five on a ninety-four, you're gonna be able to feel it. You're gonna feel the transmission shift from one to two, two to three, three to four, and then you're gonna see another little blip on the tachometer that, sh- that drops about two hundred RPM. That's a torque converter locking up. 94 is an early enough vehicle where you can just barely touch the brake pedal and then see if that tachometer comes up 200 RPM because you can cancel the what we call the torque converter clutch lockup with the brake pedal. So it does seem like the RPM is, is high. Let's make sure we're getting all the way into fourth gear. That would be my, my thing. Gas mileage might not be very good. In the, the torque converter, but you said the torque converter lockup's only going to drop at a couple hundred RPM. 200 RPM, but if we're if if we have a difference between 3,300 RPM and 2,500 RPM, we're we're missing a gear. Well, yeah, that's what I say. There's there's a lot more happening there than the than the torque converter potentially. But you should feel uh you know you should feel the three events you know happening to make sure you're, you're going all the way. So we are going to go with uh, Arnold in Phoenix on a '93 Honda Accord. Go ahead, Arnold. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, hey, thanks for taking my call, guys. Um, are you guys hey Arnold, we're going to put you back on hold because uh, we ran a little bit of a time snag. I wasn't looking at the clock, so put you on hold. We'll get you after the break. Well, in the meantime, Dave, we're, we're, we're talking about the uh, green bicycle lanes. That's the big deal in the city of Phoenix right now. They're going to make some some of the bike paths green, and you're a bicyclist. Oh, I'm going to rant because I got I got honked at last week on my bike. And if you're one of those guys that's honking at bicycles, you really need to go to the confessional and, and really <laughs> rethink life. You know, somebody on a bike is completely vulnerable. I mean, come on, if you're on a bike, you wouldn't want somebody honking at Dave, you. I think you probably deserve to be honked at on occasion. Well, and if you're riding a bike, you got to be considerate of people in the cars. But remember, who's going to win out here if we get in an accident? I- I'm pretty sure the car's going to win out. So when we come back, we still have open lines at 602-277-5827. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen, and we are reminding you not to honk at bicyclists today. I can't believe anyone would honk at a bicyclist. Matt and I were looking at the rules before the show, and you're supposed to give a bike three feet room. And Matt said he even saw a sign the other day that says three foot of rim to bicyclist. And really, the other thing I saw was five, five foot would be even better. Five is suggested. Three, I was up by a Rio Verde area, way northeast. 
Scottsdale, and I was surprised when I saw that. It just it made me think of you. It made me think of running, <laughs> running you over, Dave. Are you I going look for really a, good in those tight shorts. Are you going for a bike ride today? I am going but for a bike ride. But you're going in the desert. So yeah, mountain not, bikes. You're not worried, worried about the trail. Most of the people I road bike with, they say, man, you are crazy riding a mountain bike. And I'm like, we don't have cars. <laughs> Well, you know, I was telling you during the show when we were talking about that because of the green bicycle lane thing that they're doing in Phoenix. Um, the bicyclists need have the same rights as the car on the road. You can go, you can ride in the lane. You can go through the green light. You can do do whatever. We're going to treat you like you would another car, excuse me, or a motorcycle. But you also have the same responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So don't think that you get to run the stop sign, too, because you're on a bike and not the car. So you need to stop, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I had some guy yell at me the other day, and I forget what it was for. I had my window down. I was leaving my neighborhood. I'm like, what are you? You're the one that went blown through the stop sign, not me. <laughs> He's mad at you? So, yeah, he, he was mad at me. I, you know, Sometimes you think you're on the bicycle, so you get a free pass. Mm. But uh, now it might rile some people up. Who knows? Yeah, right. Don't honk at bicycles and tie in that road rage. You know, road rage, I had somebody yesterday <laughs> got pretty mad at me. And they probably should have been mad at me. <laughs> so we're going to go with Doug in Scottsdale on a 2008 Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Doug. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. How are you doing today? Good. What can we help you with, Doug? Uh, it's actually a pretty good timing. I just had a, a tire pressure sensor, TPS, go out last week. And it's the, they're the uh, standard. They're the ones that came with the car. So they're sure. uh, seven years old or whatever. So what I'm wondering is, should I just go ahead and replace all four since they're all that age? Mm, that was our conversation before the show. Well, I Don't mean, go one or two. It's like, uh, you know, take your bathroom vanity. One of the light bulbs goes out. You're going to replace all six or eight of them, or are you going to do just one? I guess if I was doing tires, if it was time to replace the tires, I would take advantage of the economies of the scale of the labor. You've got to take those things off. You've got to bust the tires down. You're right there. Might as well. I would do all four of them if you're going to plan on keeping the vehicle. The lifespan of these tire pressure sensors is about seven years, and we've known that for many years going in. In 2007, when they started having the having them in, uh, uh, required, we we knew it was going to be about seven years, and we're starting to see them. So. If you're not going to replace all the, if the tires are not getting replaced, maybe just do one at a time because there's no extra. You haven't lost anything, I guess, is what I'm, my point is. And you got to wonder, it's like uh, which one did I replace last? You know, because they get rotated, moved around, and all that well, stuff. Well, the one that doesn't work is not the one that you didn't replace. <laughs> That's the last. one you go replace. All right. Yeah. Um, it's just an for me, it's just an annoyance feature. You know, that the light turns on this morning. I'm like, oh, really? Do I get to look at that light? Well, but like I said, if you're going to replace, if you're not replacing the tires, do the one, and then in five months when you replace the tires, maybe do the other three. It's a personal preference. What's your time worth? What's the convenience of it? What's the economics of it? Hey, Doug, if you follow my advice and not match, you're going to be way better off. <laughs> we appreciate the phone call. Let's go with uh, looks like uh, Arnold uh, Jim uh, on a '72 F100 pickup. Go ahead, Jim. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, guys. How you doing? I Good. I need to replace a uh, transmission mount on my pickup, and I was wondering, uh, is that something that a person can do at home, and how complicated is it? I would say it would be relatively a project that you could do in the driveway. Um, there's going to be a, a cross member that goes from frame rail to frame rail. In general, there's one or two bolts you know, on the, on the cross member that hold it down, and then there's one or two bolts that hold it to the transmission. So... Not a not a super huge project, but something you could definitely handle in the driveway. Uh, the one thing about some of those older mounts is that it's hard to find good mounts for some of the older vehicles. Yeah, you, I mean, you might get two mounts because one may <laughs> I mean, uh, one may not be good enough. It may not may not fit right. What are the kind of tools you're going to need, Dave? Maybe a floor jack, a block of wood. Yeah, floor jack, uh, block of wood. You can put a block of wood across the uh, transmission pan. To make sure you're not going to damage it, or and then and then jack the transmission up with a floor jack once the bolts are loose, and then slide that new mount in there. You know what I say, Dave? It's like brain surgery. It's all easy as long as you know what you're doing. It's a piece of cake. <laughs> a piece of cake. <laughs> so, got some open lines: six zero two two seven seven five eight two seven six zero two two seven seven K T A R. And of course, if you want to text us four one one ninety two three, we have a text came in from. 
I don't know who it came in from, Dave, but having a question about their Hyundai Sonata having a four-cylinder and want to know if it has a timing belt. And I believe on that car it does have a timing belt. 2006, you're probably, or 2007, it's probably right in the neighborhood for replacement, too. On some of the earlier Hyundais and Kias, it was 60,000 miles. They've moved that up to 90,000 miles. Some cars now are even 105,000. Uh, but then that changes with severe service and and in uh, the conditions and how you're driving. So if if you've got that uh, Hyundai Sonata, uh, I would be. We had this we had this debate in, off off air in the show uh, last week with a guy from the dealership, and he was saying, "Oh, we do them at 60, you know, because there's a little, you know, the, the recommendation was 90 or 110,000." But there was a little subnote that says if it normally operates in temperatures above 110 degrees. And your point was it's only 110 degrees for like three months, and that's only for two hours during the day, and that's like 1% of the time, the entire time here. Yeah, well, I mean, timing belts is one of those things where people stretch that a little bit. I think the dealers in some places are a little bit more uh, aggressive than we are. They might say we're more aggressive because they just do the belt and we want to do the water pump and other things. But if I'm telling you right now, if your time belt says 105,000 miles, and, except for severe service, you look at that definition, consistently over X temperature and consistently dusty. It's not consistently that all the time here. I might step it up to 90. I sure as heck wouldn't be doing 60. Well, I see them all the time with a, on Hondas. I'm talking about Hondas, not on the Hyundais. You know, on the Hyundai, maybe a little earlier. But on, on the Honda, you know, I see them with 110,000 miles on them. And people are like, well, should I be doing it? At that point, you got to oh, be doing yeah. it. Don't be, don't be playing, with, uh, playing with fire there. It's, there's a lot of things in the manuals that I disagree with. Some of the fluid intervals I think are not long enough. Timing belt, I'm fine with 105,000. Maybe make it 90 so that you don't – we try to break it up too, Dave, because at – Let's just say 105,000. You might have all these other things that need to get done too. So now we got to start. Now we're starting to delay things or break them up into different categories to make it easier to swallow. So that may be another good reason to start looking at that 100,000 mile service at 90. Get some of the stuff out of the way, but don't wait to do your coolant and then redo your coolant 10,000 miles. Do it when you do the tiny belt and the water pump. That's why you've got to be really working with a good shop who's going to have this conversation with you and think it all the way through. Well, you said something I found interesting. We'll get back to these calls, but you said, I disagree with a lot of the manuals. How could you disagree with the manual? That's a factory. They know everything, man. These recommendations go through years of R&D, and Matt down at Virginia Auto thinks that uh, he knows what's best. Come on. Well, they do do their testing here in the hot climates, but they're in the marketing department. They want to sell new cars. Mm. Do they want your car to last you 250,000 miles? Mm, Hell no, no. they don't, because they want to sell you a new one in three years. That's what they want to do. Um, and, and then there's just reality. Those, those, A lot of that testing is done under perfect conditions, and a lot of it's done in, in harsh conditions. A lot of people have proving grounds here, but they're not here all year long. They're they're not going and stop and go. I mean, they're, they're simulating the best they can, but there's reality. Well, they you repeated, know, repeated, repeated, repeated. Well, let's go to Arnold before uh, I get going too much on this. Arnold on a 1993 Honda Accord. Go ahead, Arnold. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. How you doing, guys? I got a yeah, I got a 19 Honda Accord. It's got 195,000 miles on it, going running strong. Uh, but just this, since last week, like you guys were talking about the temperature earlier, uh, early morning when I go to work, uh, the RPMs will start fluctuating. It'll be sitting in neutral. And the RPM will jump two down to one, two down to one. It'll do that uh, at least until it gets, I, I'm assuming it does until it gets to a running temperature. Now, I was told it could be a sensor or something like that, but I'm not too sure exactly what it is. So when it gets back up to operating temperature, the idle smooths out? Yeah, when it's yeah. sitting in the, the idle, the RPM will jump. And then when, once, it, once it heats up, and like uh, say like two weeks ago when it was still 90, it wasn't happening at all. Okay. But just this week since we got down the temperatures. Well, on the on the ninety three Accord or any late model car for that matter, the the computer controls the idle. It's looking for at various temperature inputs uh, from different sensors. On the Honda, they call it a TW sensor, but it's the water sensor uh, for the computer. It's going to tell you, hey, it's fifty degrees out here. It's cold. We want the engine's going to want a higher idle. It's going to want more fuel. Uh, it's going to look at throttle position input, all kinds of different inputs, and the computer is going to send out signals to different devices to increase the throttle, increase 
fuel delivery. So it's probably something related to the temperature. I wouldn't just go throwing out there a new sensor because someone thinks it might be a sensor. In, in those cases, most of the time, you, you've got to go in and figure out what's wrong. In a 93 Accord, Dave, you asked me earlier, are we making the difference or making the transition? Some Are cars getting harder to work on or are they easier? They go through these cycles. I would say they're easier right now in some cases, but now a 93 Accord, that's a little bit harder. That's not just a mm, plug fairly, and play. fairly easy what's... plug in. You've got to... You've got to know what you're doing on the car, and then well, and then go in and do some uh, just a couple of quick tests, and should be able to. And me, I'm looking. I'm looking at the data, so I got. I do have a scanner plugged in, and I can see the different sensors and what they're all telling. And I'm looking for the one that doesn't make sense. And when I see, you know, a temp sensor may say, "Hey, you know, we're we're uh, you know we've got 180 degrees going on when I just started the car, and it's dead cold." Well, hey, I know I got a problem there. Let's go look at that temp sensor. Let's go look at the wire connection. Let's go see if there's something going on. You can check it with a voltmeter as well. So we're going to go with Grace in Phoenix. She looks like she's calling about a bicycle. Might have got somebody riled up yeah. here. Yeah. Do you honk at, do you no, honk at people I'm on bikes? I'm not really riled up, but I do uh, object to the fact that uh, you bicyclists, you want uh, all the rights that a driver has. Uh. <laughs> but I've seen so many, you go sailing right through the stop signs, you don't yield, you just go right on through, and that's not fair to the, the uh, motorist. Mm, that's you, right. I'm on I, your team, Grace. Dave, I, I had someone <laughs> holler at me the other day for that, too. I, I uh, You're absolutely right. So if you ride a bike out there and you're running stop signs, you know, because I have been, you know, I'm looking, I don't see anybody, you know, I, I, I will go blowing through it, so, you know. Uh, I'll own up to that. But uh, but I do want to make the point. I mean, someone on a bike is totally vulnerable. So fair or not fair, I'm all about protecting the vulnerable in society. <laughs> and the guy's vulnerable <laughs> on a bicycle. Don't honk at him. If you want to fall him to his house and chew him out, I think you should do that instead. <laughs> Come on, Dave. <laughs> now we're really going to get something going here. But I can see why. I mean, this bicycle, you're relying on momentum. You don't want to stop. All is clear. Not like you're going to run through that intersection and clobber somebody like uh, running the red light in a car. But uh it, uh, you know, you can't have uh, you, you, your cake and eat it, too, I guess. I don't or know. can you? Well, Grace, your point is well taken, and we've got an open line at 602-277-5827. we come back, a little bit of fact or fiction. Well, good day, and welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen. He's Dave Riccio. And like every Saturday at 11, we are talking about cars. And whether it's uh, our topic, a topic you want to talk about, all you've got to do if you want to participate is give us a call, 602-277-5827. Well, I get, I get a text you got to from... turn on your mic is what you got to do there, Dave. <laughs> I got a text from Joel at Arizona Imports, who is our uh, critiquer. He's our, he's our armchair quarterback, and he said, oh, six and not a timing chain. So, uh, you know, may so want to double check on that. We were answering a, to a uh, text from before. So many of those Hyundais are timing belt. Well, even some of the Hondas now you're seeing to move over to a timing chain, which ones that traditionally had belts have chains, and now you're seeing, you know, it's it's making the the uh, the pendulum is swinging, Dave. Well, I got that. And then I got another text here. Uh, can a broken motor mount cause further issues? Uh, absolutely. You know, that's the one thing I tell people when they when they are putting off motor mounts, because motor mounts, they last in general 80,000 miles, 100,000 miles. They can be very expensive to replace. They could be, you know, $500, upwards of $1,200 in some of your exotic cars. You can spend a lot more money than that. They're rubber. They isolate vibration from the engine and transmission into the feel of your seat. Uh, but they do wear out. They're kind of like tires. You know, I always say replace them in, you know, pairs, either a pair or all four at the same time. The car's got 80,000 miles on it. Two of them are broken. Just go ahead and hit them all. They're all the same age. You know, like rubber band. I mean, how many times can you take the rubber band and stretch it out, put it back, stretch it out, put it back, without it being all, you know, you're there, do it all at once. Well, if you can and, afford to do that. If you they, can, and there's nothing wrong with we're, we're placing one or two at a time, a la carte, it just make more cost you more in the long run. I have two different kind of comments. One, again, it goes back to the shop that you're working with. If you've got, let's just say you're doing the timing belt. We're talking about timing belts on the car right now. You're taking off typically one mount of the engine because it's it, it's going to if it's a transverse engine, it's going to be the timing belt's going or the timing belt side mounts typically going to come off. Is that the time to replace the mount to be proactive? If the car's got 105,000 miles on it, it's a little collapsed. 
yeah, go ahead. Maybe do that one. Go ahead and do it. But the point to it is, this question was, can it do more damage? And the point is, that was when the question. mounts are bad and they're flopping, or your engine's flopping around under there, it's stretching all the radiator hoses, the, the connection of the radiator hoses, the radiator, all the wiring harnesses. Older cars, one of the things we fight, old wiring harnesses with a little bit of chafing here and there adds up to little glitches in the car that aren't worth tracking that down. That was going to be the second part of my comments. I was going to ask you what else. You know, so the, yeah, the the hoses, the wiring harnesses, you ever see a car with a hood with a hood with a dent going out? <laughs> I mean, I've that, got that customer. That would be an extreme condition, <laughs> but you know, you'd step on the gas and the thing jumps up so much the engine hits the hood. But what about the what about Dave just the the vibrations and the extra you ever have a car come into your shop and I mean the Damn thing! The whole thing's just vibrating. It's shaking the dash loose. I mean, mm. now you've got creaks and rattles inside the car. So, not necessarily things that are going to make you break down. But right. there are I things hate that are going to rattles in cars. Tax the rest yeah. of the car. I can't help but get in people's car and hear rattles uh. in there. Like, Do you hear that? No, no, not at all. My brother, he's the worst man. His car's like falling apart. Do you hear that? No, Dave, I don't. It's like, how do, you, how do you boil a frog very slowly? So let's go with Lauren and Tempe on a 2005 Nissan Altima. Go ahead, Lauren. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, funny enough, I was just the guy that, that sent in the text about that motor mount. <laughs> Did we um, answer your question? <laughs> just about. See, the, the issue here is someone's trying to sell me that car, and it actually doesn't run. And, and uh, the guy that's... the family member of a guy that's selling me the car, so I'm getting, I guess, a little, you know, backdoor info, um, told me that they, they're not maintaining it very well, and that they drove it for roughly, you know, 100, 120,000 miles with a broken motor mount. The guy, obviously, the guy selling me isn't telling me, trying to sell it to me, isn't trying to tell me too much, but, you know, my concern is, you know, driving, putting that many miles on a car, you know, if I was to buy, you know, that car for, you know, a grand, fifteen hundred, two grand, because it doesn't run, you know, is it pretty predictable to to see what's wrong with it, knowing that it's the broken motor mount, um, or you know, is is, I guess, what well, with just that little information, you know, uh, I didn't think that it would cause any severe issues that would uh, keep it from running, but but you're um, talking about a car right now. This car doesn't even run. Is that correct? It, it turns on, but it doesn't run very well. Um, it, it's r- really rough. Um, you know, it doesn't idle right. Right. Um, you know, it sounds like some sensor issues, but, you know, out of the thousands of sensors or, you know, out of a lot of sensors, you know, I don't, I don't know if, you know, it could be on. Well, whenever you're buying a used car, I mean, there could, if it's running, I, I mean, if you're going to pick a 2000, what was that? 2005. Five for thousand bucks there's gonna be some stuff wrong with it well yeah definitely i mean (laughs) it's not just gonna be some cherry but uh uh you know you'll probably you can't probably can't go wrong you buy the car for a thousand you might be able to get it running worst case you you gotta unload the thing and ditch out on it and lose a couple hundred bucks i don't know um sounded like 120,000 miles 05 ultima that doesn't sound like a bad car but the point here I wanted to make is get that thing checked out by your mechanic. You know, you're in Tempe. We've got Arizona import specialist. The guy's a he's a Nissan guy forever. Go see him. Look at it. You know, he'll he'll point you in the direction. The one thing that guys that hit, that look under cars and have been looking at cars for years, we see so many things right off the bat. You know, things you want to be worried about. Things you want to be, I mean, when you get under a car, Matt, can you help but not see things that are wrong with it? Well, it's yeah, just what you've been, you, it's you, what you've been you doing for years. Everything. You don't even have to get underneath the car a lot of times. You know, like you said, you jump in your brother's car, right? Jump in my mom's car, and you notice stuff right away. may not be the stuff that that uh, that Lauren needs to know why his car isn't running right. You're not going to just find that, but we can always find the other things that maybe you just don't notice because it's slowly been happening over time. Did you know they are celebrating Bob Bonneron's birthday today in uh what is the name? It's not Firebird Raceway anymore, is it? No, it's Wild Horse Pass uh, Motorsports Park or Wild Horse Motorsports Park. He's 80 years old, and that's a guy that's been racing cars for a long time. Last spring, I think it was, Matt and I went out to Bondurant. We got a we got a hot lap with Bob, and for 80 years old, man, he can he throw can down. Yep. I mean, there was like, you know, I'm like, 
you know, he's really good at this. I hope he just doesn't know. <laughs> he's uh, it's pretty exciting to have that right years, in town. 80 years, a couple other things. If you want a free, well, not a free brake job, but if you want free brake pads for your brake job, at Virginia Auto Service, which is one of the bumper-to-bumper shops, you'll find at bumper-to-bumperradio.com. So Virginia Auto Service and Accurate Automotive in Mesa. And Virginia Auto Service is downtown. Free brake pads for brakes for breasts during the month of October. And uh, basically you get free brake pads. We're going to do the brake work on your car and donate some money to the Cleveland Clinic. And then coming up when October 26th, we're going to do bumper-to-bumper remote live from Tri-City Transmission in Tempe. Open house. Going to have a food truck there schlepping what? Grilled cheese sandwiches, Dave? Oh, uh, providing a grilled cheese food truck will be out making grilled cheese sandwiches. That could be and, fun. Uh, yeah. You can get the details at tricitytransmission.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page, but uh, it's a, you know 10 to 1 o'clock. Be out there. Technicians answering questions. We've got transmissions taken apart. You can look at them. Open Just house, right? The whole open shop house. will be open. Walk around if you've got questions that you've been longing to have answered. So we will look forward to seeing you next week.